One of the most interesting but least known of the Apostolic Fathers was the enigmatic figure of the second century, the early second century, Papias. Unfortunately, the writings of Papias have come down to us only in snippets. With the other Apostolic Fathers, we actually have manuscripts of their writings, completely preserved, manuscripts that have been transmitted down through the Middle Ages, or else manuscripts that have been discovered in modern times. The writings of Papias, on the other hand, were not preserved in manuscript form. We know of them only insofar as small portions of his writings were quoted by later church fathers, such as the, uh, the father of church history, Eusebius, in the 4th century. At one time, however, Papias' works were recognized as significant. He was the first known author to collect the sayings of Jesus and provide an extended interpretation of them. His last work was in five volumes and was called An Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord. It's not clear whether this book, uh, The Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord, actually was uh, dealing only with the sayings of Jesus or whether it was an extended commentary on everything involving Jesus' life. In any event, whether it dealt just with the sayings or with a fuller narrative, it is quite clear that there was, there was narrative about Jesus' life found in uh, Papias' own exposition, in the comments that he made, at least, on the sayings of Jesus. Given its length, it was uh, five volumes long, Papias obviously had collected a lot of material that is not found in the Gospels of the New Testament. We're fortunate that Papias tells us what his sources of information were. As it turns out, principally, they were the companions of the apostles themselves, whom Papias had met and interviewed for information about what Jesus' disciples had said about him. We learn this from one of the fragments that has been preserved of Papias' writings as it's quoted, uh, quoted in, the, uh, in the Church Fathers. This particular fragment is from Eusebius, from his church, uh, church history, where Papias is uh, quoted as saying, I also will not hesitate to draw up for you, his reader, along with these expositions, an orderly account of all the things I carefully learned and have carefully recalled from the elders, for I have certified their truth, he says. And he goes on to say uh, that uh, whenever someone arrived who had been a companion of one of the elders, in other words, when anyone who had been a companion of one of the, uh, the early apostles arrived in town, I would carefully inquire after their words to find out what Andrew or Peter had said, or what Philip or what Thomas had said, or James or John or Matthew or any of the other disciples of the Lord. So he has interrogated and questioned, uh, interviewed these uh, companions of the disciples. And I would seek to find out what things Aristion and the elder John, who were disciples of the Lord, were saying. Eusebius uh, makes a point uh, when he, Eusebius, uh, who's writing this in, in a volume of his church history, is talking about Papias. He makes the point that Papias appears to differentiate between two groups of people who uh, provided authorization for his message. On the one hand, there are the, uh, the disciples of Jesus himself, who, uh, whose companions he, he's talked to on occasion. He doesn't indicate he's ever talked to any of the disciples, but he's talked to their companions. So he's probably living after the disciples have died, but the companions are still around. But the second group is a group that he calls the elders, uh, such as the elder John and this person named uh, Aristion. They're also disciples to the extent that they're followers of Jesus, but these appear not to have been Jesus' own earthly 12 disciples. So they, uh, they may be... Uh, uh, important figures from the church from the from the second century. Uh, he concludes this quotation with the following words: "For I did not suppose that what came out of books would benefit me as much 
as that which came from a living and abiding voice. In other words, Papias preferred talking to people who were connected with the apostles of Jesus to reading things in books, so that he would much prefer talking to a companion of Matthew than reading the Gospel of Matthew. He thought that the living voice was more valuable. We'll, uh, we'll see uh, the significance of that in the, in the next lecture when I talk about the importance of oral tradition for early Christianity more broadly and, uh, and with respect to Papias himself. The traditions we have about Papias indicate that he himself was a companion of Polycarp. Uh, Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, whom we've met on numerous occasions, and that along with Polycarp, Papias had been actually a, a, a disciple of John the son of Zebedee. This is a later tradition that is very hard to verify, and in fact, uh, if you listen carefully to that quotation, there's reason to think that Papias was not actually a disciple of John the son of Zebedee, because he refers to his uh, his uh, uh his interviewing companions of John to find out what John had said. Well, that, that suggests that he himself wasn't one of the companions of John. Later traditions, though, indicate that not only was he a disciple of John, he actually was John's secretary to whom John dictated his gospel. And so we find, for example, in the later tradition, for when the last of the uh, apostles, John, who's called the Son of Thunder, had become a very old man, fearful heresies had sprouted up. And so he dictated the gospel to his own disciple, the respectable Papias of Hier uh, Hierapolis, so as to complete the work of those before him who had proclaimed the word to the nations throughout the world. This, uh, what, what that's indicating is that the three other gospel writers had produced their works, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that John, as a very old man, produced his, his gospel, and he dictated it then to Papias. This is a later tradition, again, that, um, that does not appear to be uh, authentic. What we can say about Papias is that he appears to have been, based on his own words, he appears to have been a generation removed from the companions of Jesus' disciples. This would make him active sometime around the year A.D. 110 to uh, 130 is the best uh, guesstimate, sometime between A.D. 110 and 130. The connections that the later legends make between Papias and Polycarp and then Papias and Polycarp and John appear to be part of the attempt by later Orthodox writers to trace the line of apostolic succession from the days of Jesus down to their own time. And so the way it worked is, you have the writings of Papias, and you want to know if these are uh, these are worth anything or not. Oh yes, they're worth a lot. Why? Well, because he was a companion of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a, was a bishop of the Church of Smyrna. Not only that, but Polycarp and Papias were disciples of John, and John was a disciple of Jesus, and Jesus came from God. And so this writing is perfectly acceptable. So you, uh, the, these legends about his relationship, especially his relationship with John, were probably propagated in order to provide a, a, secure, uh, um, a secure understanding of his authority to, uh, to write the, uh, the five-volume book that he did. It was in large measure because of his quirky views that Papias came to be regarded as suspicious by later authors. Uh, I'm not saying that I myself find them quirky in comparison with other writings from the early church, but it is clear that there were uh, church fathers, especially in proto-Orthodox circles, who came to think that Papias represented a quirky perspective. In, uh, in one respect in particular. In particular, it was Papias's literal interpretation of the future millennium that led to his falling out of favor with the later representatives of orthodoxy. And so I need to give some background to make sense of what Papias' understanding of the future millennium was in order to put all of this in context. If you recall from our earlier lectures, from the earliest of times, Christians had maintained an apocalyptic worldview, starting with Jesus himself, who is probably best understood to have been an apocalyptic prophet, 
who proclaimed that there was coming a future kingdom of God to earth. The kingdom of God that Jesus predicted as coming soon was not heaven in the world above. In other words, Jesus does not appear to have had the view uh, that we'll talk about later in this lecture that's common among Christians today, that a person dies and their soul goes to heaven and then they're in the kingdom of God. That isn't what the kingdom of God was for Jesus. The kingdom of God for Jesus appears to have been a real kingdom, a kingdom here on earth, which would be ruled over by earthly rulers, the 12 disciples, in fact, as, as it turns out, and it would be headed by the future Messiah. Jesus was living at a time in which the kingdoms of earth were ruled, in the opinion of many Jews, by evil rulers who were empowered by evil cosmic forces. Demonic forces have set up the major kingdoms of earth, as we find, for example, in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Many Jews, including Jesus, seem to think that God was going to overthrow these evil kingdoms and set up his own kingdom. But it would be a kingdom here on earth where God would rule through his appointed Messiah and his Messiah would rule through his underlings, in, in Jesus' case, the 12 apostles who are going to be the 12 rulers of the future kingdom. For example, Jesus says uh, in the Gospel of Mark, our earliest gospel, this is the first, the earliest recorded uh, saying of Jesus in, in Mark, chapter 1, verse 15, where Jesus says, The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, repent and believe the good news. This is an apocalyptic image. This age has an allotted amount of time that has been given to it, and the time has been fulfilled. So, in other words, this, the time is almost up. The kingdom of God is at hand, meaning it's very near. People are to repent and prepare for its coming. This kingdom, as I've indicated, would be a real kingdom ruled by real rulers. Uh, in particular, Jesus indicates at one time in a saying that must be authentic, I think, that his own 12 disciples would be the rulers of the kingdom. At one point, Jesus is talking to his disciples in the Gospel of Luke, and it's also found in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says, uh, Truly I tell you, you twelve will be sitting on twelve thrones ruling the, ruling the tribes of Israel. Okay? His understanding was that there be a future son of man, a future uh, cosmic deliverer who would be over the kingdom of God, and the twelve disciples would be twelve rulers over the kingdom. There's a very good reason for thinking that this is something that Jesus actually said. Now, we, we know there are a lot of sayings in our Gospels, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but in the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Thomas and all of our other Gospels, there are a lot of sayings that Christians made up and put on Jesus' lips. That sometimes happens even in the canonical Gospels. But this is not a saying that a Christian would have made up and put on his lips, which means it must be a saying that Jesus actually said. Why is it that, uh, that nobody would have made up this saying? Because Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples and he tells them they will be the 12 ruling in the kingdom. But one of the 12 was Judas Iscariot. And later Christians knew that Judas Iscariot had turned Jesus in. So no Christian thought that Judas Iscariot would be one of the 12 rulers. But the saying indicates that all 12 will be rulers. So Jesus must have said, actually said this during his lifetime. Jesus actually anticipated his 12 disciples would be 12 rulers over the kingdom over the kingdom when it arrived. This kingdom was expected to replace the wicked kingdoms of earth. Now, in making this proclamation of the coming kingdom, Jesus was, in fact, standing in a long line of prophets who predicted that God would eventually reassert his control over this world. This world, obviously, is not completely under God's control. If this world is under God's control... Why is it that thousands of people die every day of starvation and other poverty-related causes? Why is it that we have tsunamis where millions of people are left homeless and uncounted people are killed? How do you explain that if God's in charge? Well, according to the prophets, even if God doesn't appear to be in charge now, he's going to become in charge and he's going to reassert control over this world. And when he does, it's going to be a paradise-like existence. Expectations of what it would be like 
when God reasserted control of this world, uh, go all the way back to the Hebrew prophets of the, uh, of the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible. For example, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, who uh, was prophesying in the 8th century B.C., so 800 years, uh, 750 years before Jesus or so. Isaiah uh, has this very famous passage, uh, parts of which will sound familiar to you. It begins in chapter 11. A shoot shall come forth from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesse was the father of King David, and this is saying that there's going to be uh, a, a shoot from the uh, family tree. Uh, this is a reference to a future son of David who will be like David, will be a messianic figure. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. So that it goes on to say that this future son of David will be like David. It will be a person of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might. It goes on to describe what life will be like once this son of David arrives and begins his rule. Verse 6. The wolf shall lie, uh, the wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea." This is a beautiful passage describing the utopian-like existence that will come about in the future age when a son of David once again reascends the throne and becomes the king of Israel. Jesus, though, had a somewhat more apocalyptic vision of what it would be like when the future kingdom arrived. As he anticipated that this future kingdom would not simply be a utopian existence on earth, he actually anticipated that with the coming of the kingdom, there would be an overthrow of the forces of evil when a figure whom he called the Son of Man arrived from heaven in judgment on the earth. Jesus um, had a, a different view from many of the uh, prophets of the Old Testament in that he thought that the reason people were suffering now was not because God was punishing them, but because there were powers of evil in the world cosmic forces that were causing the disasters that were striking the earth. When the kingdom comes, according to Jesus, these cosmic forces that have so thoroughly infiltrated this world will be destroyed. God will remake the heavens and the earth uh, for a place of habitation for his followers. For example, Mark chapter 8, verse 38 through chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus says, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of that person the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes on the clouds of heaven in the presence of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. Jesus anticipates there will be some coming figure that he calls the Son of Man. In this passage, it's not at all clear that he's talking about himself as the Son of Man. In fact, quite the contrary. If you didn't think Jesus was the Son of Man, you would never think so on the basis of this passage, which is one reason for thinking this is something that Jesus actually said. Because if, if a Christian wanted to make up a saying of Jesus and put it on his lips, they wouldn't leave it ambiguous as to whether Jesus thought he was the Son of Man because Christians thought Jesus was the Son of Man. This is ambiguous, at least, I mean, it doesn't look like Jesus is talking about himself here. And so uh, probably something that Jesus said. Jesus expected the Son of Man to arrive in judgment, and he expected it would happen before all of his disciples died. Or as he says uh, later on in Mark, in the famous uh, passage of chapter 13, where Jesus narrates what it will be like when the end comes. In those days, after all that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. The coming of the end will be a cataclysmic event of cosmic proportions in which this cosmos is destroyed and remade and the kingdom of God then will arrive. Jesus' preaching of the future kingdom was taken up by his followers, as can be seen by the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul, too, expected the end to come within his own generation. Paul's expectation had shifted somewhat from that of Jesus. Jesus had anticipated that a figure called the Son of Man was going to arrive on the clouds of heaven. Paul thought that Jesus, who had been raised from the dead and exalted to heaven, was himself the Son of Man, who was going to come on the clouds of heaven. And so Paul talks about Jesus returning in judgment on the earth, and Paul anticipates that when this happens, when Jesus returns, he uh, himself will still be alive. The key passage, uh, one of the key passages, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and following. Paul says, We do not want you to be un- uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the people who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Okay, a little background. Paul's writing this letter to his congregation in Thessalonica. He had evidently started this church by convincing former pagans to worship the God of Israel and Jesus his son, and he taught them that Jesus is soon to return in judgment on the earth, and when he does, the kingdom will come. In the interim, between the time Paul left the community and the time that he's now writing this letter, some members of the community have died. Paul uh, has uh, has been informed that some of the members of the congregation are upset by the fact that these people have died because they think that these people have lost out on the benefits of the coming kingdom. And so Paul has to write to explain to them that in fact they haven't lost out on the benefits of the coming kingdom. And so he says uh, that uh, you should not be informed about those who have died so that you may not grieve. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word of the Lord. This is the key passage. That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, so Paul's including himself, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have have died. For the Lord himself with a cry of command and the archangel's call and the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Uh, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the passage that uh, that, uh, evangelical Christians have used to talk about the rapture, when Jesus returns and people rise up to meet him in the air. The term rapture, uh, as you noted, does not actually occur in this passage. This uh, this understanding of the end times uh, uh, presupposes that there are three stories to our universe, that the universe is built on three stories, that that we have the place where we live now, and down below us is the realm of the dead, and up above us is the place of God. Jesus was here with us living. He died. He went to the place of the dead. But he rose, and then he ascended to the place of God. And he's going to come back down from the place of God, down to the place of the living. The people who are dead, who are down below, are going to rise up, and those who are living on this plane are also going to rise up and live with Christ in the air, the place of God. And so it's built on this kind of three-storied universe. Uh, that's... Uh, That, of course, is not the view of the universe that people have today, even though people continue to ascribe to a literal understanding of this passage, and some people subscribe to a literal understanding of this passage in 1 Thessalonians. A similar passage can be found in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God 
nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. In other words, the kingdom can't come to us while we're still just mortals, flesh and blood. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Again, he's including himself. For this perishable body must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality. So bodies are going to be transformed uh, at the last trumpet. People are going to be changed then, uh, bodily changed into immortal bodies so that they can inherit the kingdom. The kingdom of God is a future kingdom that will be lived in bodily by people whose, whose bodies have been transformed at the coming of Jesus. This is the understanding of Paul, again, in an apocalyptic sense of what happens at the end time. Papias, writing two generations later, continued to subscribe to some kind of apocalyptic vision, literally anticipating a future paradise here on earth. Uh, his description of what it's going to be like here on earth is very, uh, very uh, interesting and intriguing. He claims that he got this information from people who were familiar with John, the disciple of the Lord, who remembered how the Lord used to teach about the coming times by saying, the days are coming when vines will come forth, each with 10,000 boughs, and on a single bough will be 10,000 branches, and indeed on a single branch will be 10,000 shoots, and on every shoot there'll be 10,000 clusters, and in every cluster there'll be 10,000 grapes, and every grape when pressed will yield 25 measures of wine. <laughs> well, this is a ter terrific harvest you've got going here in the, utop in the utopian kingdom that's coming. And when one of the saints grabs hold of one of the clusters, another cluster will cry out, I'm better, take me, bless the Lord through me. <laughs> so too a grain of wheat will produce 10,000 heads, and every head will have 10,000 grains, and every grain will yield 10 pounds of pure, exceptionally fine flour. So every grain of wheat will yield 10 pounds of flour. So too with the remaining fruits and seeds and vegetation. They will, they will produce in similar proportions. Uh, and all the animals who eat this food drawn from the earth will come to be at peace and harmony with one another, yielding in complete submission to humans. That's the utopian existence that Papias imagines is happening when the kingdom of God arrives on earth. Later church fathers found this view, which they called a chiliasm, chiliasm from the uh, Latin word meaning uh, a thousand, to be far too literalistic and naive. To be far too literalistic and naive. Instead, there developed the idea that the kingdom of God was not to be taken literally as an event that would take place on earth according to later church fathers. The kingdom of God came increasingly to be seen as a metaphor for God's rule over his people, both here on earth and in heaven after death. It was probably because of his literalistic interpretations that Papias was castigated by later church writers, uh, such as the, church, the father of church history, Eusebius, who in one passage called him a man of exceedingly small intelligence. <laughs> uh, Eusebius wasn't very fond of this chiliastic understanding of uh, the end of time. And that's probably why Papias' writings were not preserved. It's interesting to observe that the apocalyptic vision of Jesus and his earlier followers then came to be transformed in later generations. No doubt that this earlier vision of the apocalypse got transformed because it didn't come. Uh, it didn't happen, and so people had to transform its meaning. Eventually, the understanding that the kingdom of God is a kingdom here came to be that the kingdom of God is a kingdom there, in heaven. The kingdom of God came to be equated with heaven. The New Testament does not teach the doctrines of heaven and hell that most people have today, that when you die, your soul goes to heaven or your soul goes to hell. Most of the authors of the New Testament thought that the kingdom of heaven would be a place here, and there would be a, a bodily existence here in this world, not uh, in the world of God up in heaven. Uh, Paul himself had that point of view, and uh, Paul 
advocated this view quite strenuously, as had Jesus before him and Paul's followers after him. Today, the vast majority of people may think of, of Christian people may think of the kingdom of God maybe as the experience of God's kingdom, his rule in the here and now, and in the afterlife, rather than a literal kingdom here on earth. But these are later views that you might call de-apocalypticized views. When the apocalypse doesn't happen, you modify the meaning of the words so that now kingdom of God actually refers to the kingdom of heaven, which refers to heaven, the place when you go, when you die. To sum up, Papias was faithful to the earliest Christian tradition about the coming of the end, and it was because he failed to adjust that vision with the passage of time that he ended up being regarded as naive and an unsophisticated thinker, even though he was one of the first to collect the sayings of Jesus and to interpret them according to the teaching of Jesus' own followers.